Perhaps you've seen images or heard descriptions of what Jesus went through on the cross. It was the most gruesome and most tormenting death that the Roman authorities of that time could produce. It was carried out by highly skilled Roman guards who were trained to inflict the most pain over the longest possible period of time. It was a slow and brutal method of execution and not to mention the most publicly humiliating way to die. Our word excruciating comes from the word crucifixion. The pain was so bad that we actually created that word excruciating from the Latin words crux and cross crucifixion. In Jesus' case, he was first beaten with fists and spit on during a mock trial. During this time, his beard was forcefully ripped from his face and his head was pressed down with a crown of long thorns. These thorns would have deeply pierced the skin uh, to the, between the skin and the skull, creating excruciating pain and bleeding. After this brutal beating and abuse, he was sentenced to being lashed with at least 39 times from an object of torture called the cat of nine tails. This, this was a leather whip that had nine leather straps at the end. Each of them were embedded with chunks of metal or bone or rock so that lashing would cut and rip the flesh. The guards, the Roman guards, were trained in using this whip with, with great skill, damaging the human body without killing it. it. It was a horrific method of torture. Finally, Jesus, now barely alive, was forced to carry a large wooden cross through a jeering crowd to a place we now call Calvary. At that place, he was laid down on the cross. He was nailed through his hands and feet, and then he was hung up to die. God told this story long before it happened when he gave us uh, the following prophecy from Isaiah chapter 53. As you hear it, realize that it's talking about what Jesus did for you personally. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and we hid as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We've turned every one to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, and he opened not his mouth. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison, and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Would you take a moment now and maybe think back through that portion of God's word. Ask God to help you understand his message to you. That scripture tells the story of exactly what Jesus was doing when he gave his life on that cross. He was giving his life for our transgressions, our sin, and making himself the offering or the payment. While on the cross, Jesus made several statements. Perhaps the most important one was this, it is finished, done. 
What was he saying? What does it is finished mean? It literally means paid in full. It means the complete final payment for every sin you ever commit is now paid. This includes all of your sins, past, present, and future, even the ones you haven't committed yet. Jesus was God's miraculous intervention. He was God on a divine rescue mission to save humanity from the power of sin and from the condemnation that sin's cancer brings. Jesus was the miracle. After he died, a Roman soldier pierced his side with a spear, verifying, validating his death, and yet again, fulfilling a very specific prophecy, proving that he was who he said. He was buried in a borrowed tomb, and after three days, he literally conquered death and rose to life again. He was seen by hundreds of people for over 40 days. And God says in Acts chapter 1, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Did you get that? infallible proof. Resurrection isn't just a myth or a legend or a lie. It was proven infallibly. Now, what does that mean for you? Well, first, Jesus' death paid the price for your sin. Your debt can truly be paid and forgiven because of what he accomplished when he said, it is finished, paid in full, done. Second, his resurrection made a new birth possible. Remember the complete spiritual rebuild that I talked about? Well, because Jesus conquered death completely, he not only offers you the payment for your sins, he offers you a brand new kind of life, a brand new spiritual identity. The miracle can be complete because he rose again. You can have a complete re-engineering of your spiritual DNA, your genetic system. Your identity with God, which makes you a new creature in his sight. You no longer have to remain that sinful creature in his sight, but a new creature with no sin debt. This is what done is all about. This is what it is finished meant on that cross. The Bible uses a really great word to describe this paid in full concept. The word is propitiation. And it simply means the full payment for. Here's where it's used. Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. And he is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Here's another, herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The Bible also calls what Jesus did reconciliation. Just as you reconcile a relationship when it experiences division, Jesus brought the potential for reconciliation between you and God. He says in 2 Corinthians And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses or sins unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. In verse 21, he says again, for he hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God made Jesus sin so we could be made righteous. That's amazing. (laughs) What an incredible gift. What an indescribable kind of love. The Bible is filled with similar verses that I just shared with you, which explain in great detail what Jesus did as our substitute and that he paid our debt in full. Take a moment right now and ask God to help you clearly understand his message in these verses. Who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world 
according to the will of God our Father, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Let me conclude this section of our videos with this one final thought. Jesus' payment for your sin was not partial. It was a full payment. I once shared this with a man who seemed to struggle with understanding the concept of a full payment. After what seemed like hours of trying to get through to him, it was like the light bulb came on in his head. He smiled and he said, man, all of my life, I've had this understanding that Jesus paid for my sins, but I've believed that it was like a two-way, you know, 50-50 proposition. In other words, Jesus did his part, but I still have to do my part. But if I understand what you're saying, Carrie, then Jesus did it all, and I can't do anything. It's not 50-50, it's 100% Jesus, 0% me. And I said, exactly, this is not a 50 50 proposition. Jesus didn't pay for part of your sin and leave you to pay for the rest. He didn't say it's almost finished. He didn't say I'm a partial propitiation. That would be an oxymoron. He didn't say it's partially paid. He said it's fully paid. Even religions that claim to believe in Jesus seem to teach that he only paid for a part of our sins. Many teach that there is still a whole, whole lot of things that you must do to make atonement for your sins, as though Jesus made a partial payment, like he made the down payment and you gotta continue to make monthly payments. That just isn't the case, and that's not the message of the Bible. Jesus paid it all, done. Friend, are you understanding this? You don't have to pay for your own sin. A miracle of divine intervention happened. God stepped in and took your punishment, all of it. And now the question is, how does this wonderful payment for my sin actually become mine? How do I get it applied to my account? How can Jesus' death be applied to me? Well, one thing we've concluded for sure, it won't involve doing, but it will involve deciding. Would you believe it's a gift? How much better can this get? Well, stick with me and let's move forward.